Okay, uh, I think we're going to get started. Um, thanks, folks, for coming out this evening to our January board voting meeting. Uh, we all we stand for the question. Uh, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we get into our um, our program, our building program report with Mr. Ray, I just want to follow up uh, briefly on um, a uh, topic that was uh, a, a major concern at our last board meeting. At, at, at that time. Um, a, uh, a number of teachers were present, and the ETEA, as well as one of our teachers, commented uh, about um, a situation related to that teacher um, that involved uh, a post on social media and the impact you know, on that teacher. There were also uh, several questions that were asked of the board at that last meeting uh, uh, concerning the, the, um, the issues. Um, and then the two postings on social media um, relate to that member of the teaching staff. So we took those uh, concerns um, and, que and questions seriously, and we directed it to uh, those those questions to uh, uh, those legal questions to our solicitor. And uh, we have received an analysis. Um, board members, however, have not had an opportunity to discuss the matter with our our solicitor and we intend to do so after tonight's meeting. We do have an executive session scheduled, so part of that executive session will be dedicated to having the conversations with our solicitor relative to the legal opinion. Um, therefore, um, or thereafter, uh, if it's appropriate to do so, uh, the board will comment publicly uh, about the situation. Uh, so that's where we stand on it. Uh, I don't see any members of the staff here or the association, but I sure they are wondering where we are in the process. I also want to indicate that we have um, uh, set up a, a policy committee meeting for this Thursday, and um, our intention is to uh, to go through the policies that were mentioned in the, in the, uh, in the, in the agreements that was uh, presented by the, um, the association, um, just uh, to see whether or not there was anything that we felt was uh, inconsistent with uh, uh, the, the legal opinions that we get, and also any other uh, concerns we might have as we operate as a school district relative to those policies. So, um, but uh, more to come, you know, on that. Uh, will be more information uh, coming forward, um, and I'm not so sure whether we'll either be reporting out at our next board meeting or if there's some other other form of uh, correspondence to come out on that. So, So I'm going to move uh, forward to the... Uh, Dave, can I just thank the sure. administration for taking those questions and addressing them uh, and putting together a response. Yeah. So I move it to the agenda. We've got Mr. Way here this evening for a, uh, a technology report. Mr. Way, I turn it over to you. Yeah, uh, evening, actually. Um, so I prepared a uh, report for you. You should have a copy of it in your packet. Um, and um, more of the same. Um, we've had a very hectic, busy year um, with a lot of uh, change, updates. Um, but the good stuff is still happening. Um, our one-to-one -one is continuing in the secondaries. Uh, we are, um, we have high student levels of engagement in Schoology, Google Apps, uh, and other district software that we're using. Um, Dan and Missy are our instructional technology um, specialists. They're out in all the buildings really doing the, the work, helping the teachers to develop and grow with the, their skills with uh, the technology. Especially, um, like I mentioned, um, really the four C's, um, communication, collaboration, creativity, and critical thinking. Those are part of the, the, the core goals that we identified very early on in the one-to-one, -one, um, as well as digital citizenship as we grew into the lower grades about appropriate, um, appropriate use of technology 
You know, uh, last year we we grew our our fourth grade technology. The, the year before we had about 15 machines in each classroom. Um, we found that to be very challenging. Again, Missy dealt with a lot of the, the challenges of fourth grade, so we, we, we grew that to a full classroom set. Um, it has been very often complicated or, or, or confused with um, a one-to-one. -one. The devices don't go home with the students, but the devices do travel with the students throughout the day and gives them um, access to some of the other things that we're talking about, student engagement, enthusiasm for learning, collaboration, um, as you had listed in the, in the sheet. We also spend a lot of time this year replacing iPads. So in our K-3s, we have a lot of centers uh, where technology is occurring throughout in the classroom. Um, we've had over 200 iPads that were um, aging out. Uh, technology companies build obsolescence into their devices. Um, our devices were at the point where they were not, they were three versions of the operating system behind and then they started to lag in some of the things like Dreambox that we were um, using uh, for curriculum. So, the technology refresh was really just a swapping out of the old for the new. We were able to um, you know, sell them off into a, a recycling market, get some money that we reinvested into the, the purchase of the new devices. Uh, Dan, do you want to talk about the cohort? I think it's important to hear about this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so this is our second year of a technology cohort with a group of 15 5 through 12 grade teachers. Last year we started this um, as Dan and I were working with teachers and, and our teachers are so willing to do whatever we ask of them and really look at how we teach with technology. But we found to get them to that next level, to get them to those four C's and not just use technology to use it effectively, if we could spend more time with them. So we put together a cohort and those teachers um, commit all their professional development time to spend with Dan and I. Their summer flex days, their early release days, their professional development days during the school year. They uh, meet with Dan and I on various topics. And yes, it's technology, but it's really about teaching practice and how to look at getting our students ready for the 21st century and how tech fits into that. It was super successful last year and our teachers overwhelmingly told us what a difference it made in their instructional practice. So we have continued that this year with 15 additional teachers at that five through 12 level and it's been very successful. We actually just met with them yesterday during our um, all day in service and had some conversation about self-care and mindfulness and how tech can actually help you with that with student assessment and authentic assessment. So, we're really moving them forward and then throughout the year, Dan and I meet with them one-on-one. -on -one, we push into their classrooms, we see what they need. Um, we will co-teach, we'll co-develop lessons with them to help them move forward uh, from wherever they are currently with teaching and their practices. Okay. Oh, and yeah, something else new that we've implemented this year, and actually from Karen Denunzio, who is a um, reading special, uh, what is her literacy title? Coach. Literacy coach, thank you. Um, got us, and we go to the uh, PIC, which is the instructional coaches for Berks County, we go to an area there, and talked about learning visits. To get teachers, we can bring them into professional development, but where it becomes very powerful is when they go into another teacher's classroom, and they see them being an expert and using an instructional practice there. So we really focused on our fourth grade teachers with those classroom sets. It's very new to them. Push, you know, In the elementary, we wanted to make sure that they weren't just using them as babysitters or they, we wanted to make sure they were using them in meaningful ways and seeing what was expected of their students when we got them to when they got to write them. So we've been taking fourth grade teachers, we pick a focus area and we go in and spend an hour or two in the classroom, then we debrief, talk about what they saw, make goals for them of how they might implement that in their classroom and then we picked the second teacher's classroom, went in, had a focus area and we've had great feedback on that as well, that it's meaningful to them to see other teachers put those best practices to work with students, and it's really made an impact, and they've gone back, and now we work with them to implement that in their classroom as well. So that's been a very new successful initiative that we've had this year. So the rest of my items that I have on here... Thanks, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> um, Classroom projector refresh. Uh, oh, by the way, I, I did get a chance to take advantage of their class and just the workshop. Those were nice. Yeah. I learned a lot about com. That com. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. I'm gonna definitely use it. 
So some of the other items on the agenda that I just want to share tonight were, um, you know, we're in the process of this classroom projector refresh. Um, uh, we are replacing projectors after, well after they're becoming difficult to procure bulbs and, and equipment for. A lot of them are having failures of ballast, you know, technology that we can't repair. So we are, we are um, about 50 projectors into this year. And uh, based on the, the, the expected life, the hours that are on them currently, we're, we're planning for about another 50 that will, will need to be replaced uh, next year. And that seems to be sort of a, we, we've done projectors, we've nibbled at projectors year after year with grant money. And so now it's that, it's the tail sort of waiting in the boat that now we have to, we have to you know, follow up with the sustainability and on the, the repairs and replacements. Uh, I, I do always uh, overlook PIMS and I spent my PIMS guys, they said, wow, you really have a lot of information about PIMS, but I think it's really important that, that you understand a huge part of what happens in IT is data management as well. And PIMS is the Pennsylvania Information Management System. Um, we are in this constant battle uploading and re-uploading re and running through a sandbox and re-evaluating uh, about 55 reports uh, a year that go to the state. So that's the number of reports. But then each of them has, you know, like, a, like a, an October version and a December version. So we have four or five different iterations of each of those reports. So I have two full-time people dedicated to the management of data and to the, uh, and the integrity of the data and verifying and validating the data before it goes up to PIMS. Another um, new element to my department has really been the amount of security, again, through grants and through nibbling away at security and cameras and stuff um, in the facilities over the last number of years. We now have amassed, a, you know, uh, over 300 cameras, um, interior and exterior, and so the maintenance of those, the support of those, uh, they add a whole new layer of, of safety, um, but they add a whole new level of challenges to, um, to the district. We, you know, we started out in this bidding process where we bid and found vendors that based on the price because then we ended up not sticking with that vendor. We're actually in our fourth camera vendor at this point. Um, and we really developed a good work, working relationship with, with um, a local vendor um, who is supporting, um, who is willing to take on all of the, the old stuff and support us through the new stuff. So we're really seeing an increase in performance, quality of the cameras that are being added to our district. And then the, the last thing, um, again, we're, we use, uh, wherever possible, we're trying to do grants. Um, E-rate is a federal program that we, are, we participate in, and um, it's based on the um, school lunch participation. We receive 50% off of purchases. We have to go through a bidding process, so we, we, we identify what our goals are, we share it with all the vendors in the state, and we're in the current process of waiting for bids to come in. And as they come in, you'll you'll see the bids um, in February, and then we will um, discuss if it's something we want to we want to add to the budget. Then we have to sort of make a commitment by the board that we agree with them, and then we have to run that through the Fed, and then we'll see the money in July. So um, it's a very um, it's part of my job. But Erie has been here as long as I've been doing IT, and it's like every year I think it's going to get better, and every year it just gets more and more challenging. So that's everything I have. Um, are there any questions for me? Before they are missing. May I ask how much we're getting for the iPads that we recycled? I want to say we got thirty-five dollars an iPad. And that's the best route to take. Apple. The recycling market. We <coughs> the next competitor was twenty. Um, and again, so my home school district, Penfield, uses iPads. They use them from 4 through 12. And so they, they have this relationship with the partner. And then after, so the student leaves, um, after a year, they sell it off and they get, you know, it's a much higher rate when the iPad is current. So if it's a year old and it's still current and supported in the operating system, you get a much higher, you know, trade-in. But as you start getting, you know, away from it and, um, we, we tend to use technology. We're still using the teacher laptops before the teacher. No, we're using two versions of teacher laptops to go to school. So we have them in circulation in all sorts of places where we just we need something to do um, student assessments or whatever. So we're using very old stuff. And at that point, um, you know, $15, $20, $30 for some of that stuff is, you know, they're, they're 
they're you know taking apart selling the screen off. Um, I really don't know um, because of Apple's obsolescence and not updating and then not being able to get critical security patches. They don't really deal really with the values you know, outside of. But it's not what I'd like to get for them. But it's it's better than them sitting here going to the land. Joe, uh, you know that I'm not a computer person. I think you've had to fail me now <laughs> half a dozen times. I report a month and a half. Um, so I'm not a lot of egg, but I am a dinosaur. Um, when I was teaching uh, probably six, seven years ago, I remember a study, reading a study, I think it was the University of Colorado, but I don't remember it exactly, so I'm hoping on that. Uh, a professor uh, monitored his students. In fact, he actually divided his classrooms into two parts. One, one half of the class took notes on the laptop. The other half took notes by hand. And he accumulated the results of his study and found out that overwhelmingly the students who took notes by hand did better on tests. So this non-Luddite dinosaur wonders, <coughs> are our students doing any better in 2019 and 2018 and 17 and 16? We've had laptops here for, or Chromebooks here for how long? Six years? This is the seventh? Six, seven. seven. Okay. But it, I mean, that's not been, but yeah, that's seven. So I guess the question is, are, are our students doing any better? Are they smarter with technology? And is there a way to measure that, either in the district or statewide or nationwide or worldwide? You, you, you know, and, and Dan and Missy and I are constantly looking at, at the research that's happening out uh, in, in educational technology. And, and I think all of us have, have paper notebooks where we keep track of our even though I have a phone in my pocket and I use Google Keep, I still find that I have scrap pieces of paper and, and, and notebooks to keep notes. Um, so again, it's learning style. Some people may thrive in that environment and some people may not. And our, you know, one of the things that we have presented with our technology one-to-one -one is that, that we, we talk about appropriateness of use, you know, and, and, and we, we constantly go back to the, to the, to the element of you know, just because you have a device does not mean you need to use the device. And, and teaching the appropriateness of when it's used and what it's used for, um, you know, and teaching the value. I mean, there's, you know, I, I, you know, my kids have iPads, but they still have drawing pads, and they still draw, and they still watercolor, and they still do those things because, you know, I limit the amount of time and exposure um, as a parent to, you know, and both of them come from a school where they have a one-to-one. -one. Uh, my daughter and in fifth grade now, she's had an iPad for three years and goes home every night and she's got worksheets and all this other stuff. But, but um, you know, mixing it up, having them, and I think that's very important. And I think our, our curriculum and I think what Dan and Missy are spending time with teachers, you know, teaching practice, you know, with technology, I think what you'll find is they're, they're often, you know, sort of saying, you know, just because you have it doesn't mean you have to use it. So, I think that appropriateness sort of answers part of your question. And the other part of it is, is really tied to that ROI that we were just talking about in the, in the meeting before. So how do you determine, and I think this is a question that we've asked for years. We relate to the game with the one-to-one. -one. There, there are districts around us that have been doing this much longer than seven years. Puts down, you know, it's one of the, the first districts in the, in, this, in the country to do a one-to-one. -one. Um, so what it, what is the, how do we know if our kids are doing better? Um, you know, we used, we used the product called Bright Bites, and we, we surveyed the students twice a year to, to learn about the sort of student affect. You know, what are they learning? How do they feel about themselves? How do they feel about instruction? Um, and, you know, we got the score, and we were like, oh, our score's increasing, so kids are really doing well. But, but then we would look at it, and we would be critical of the data and say, I don't know how, I mean, this, this element is the element that I don't understand, but this element we're doing really well on, but we don't, it's ideologically, it's something that we just don't do in the district. Right? Well, I, yeah. yeah, I mean, we, when we did Bright Lights, Bright Lights is a, a server that uses AI. It's actually where, uh, I talked to Mr. Miller a little bit about the dish, so actually where we started that customer. 
uh, so a group of teachers. Great place to give us this kind of like, use a, a model called SAMR, S A M R, uh, which stands for substitution, augmentation, modification, and redefinition. It's kind of a, uh, I think of it as like a ladder kind of going up. And you're looking for those teachers to be in that R ladder, that redefinition. So technology, it, and I'm familiar with that study from Colorado. I think it was Colorado. I think we're right. Uh, it was, uh, it's, I think it's like one, six years. Oh, probably. Yeah. <laughs> and there's been others since then. And that study looks at, like, okay, so he's a traditional teacher and I'm teaching this traditional way and I want them to learn these facts and there are ways that when, in math, I tell our math teachers that you can ask them directly, we don't use technology at all. Because when I'm writing a math problem, I want to be able to write that and manipulate that, I want to use my eraser, I want to play with that. And on a pencil or a pen, you're not going to, to do that on screen. You know, it will not come in the future, it might, we're not there yet. Uh, so with our math school, or our math department, you see them using that paper and we say, hey, that, if that works better, then that's what we're using. I, I don't want people taking notes if that doesn't work better. And if there's a hand-eye coordination or if you, you're about to take notes, take that. What the technology does, though, and this is something that, you know, I can't do that redefinition without that technology. I can't have a student create a multimedia presentation with a pen and paper. I can't break out a, a real, real projector or go out to sell a widget and break out my slideshow or bring my overhead project that or quite frankly virtually teach and that's what we want our kids when I look at full use of technology and our students I want them to be prepared to be successful in the world that they're going into so I mean I love writing letters my grandmother and I wrote letters till she passed away but the reality situation is that's you know I can't remember the last time I handled a letter anybody in our district right it just doesn't happen so we're trying to we, we almost need that to prepare our students because quite frankly um, and we talk about this with the EBA program too and our students do these online classes um, they're going to go to whatever program they go to. And we rolled out one one. I think, Connor, you were a senior, right? I was in Mr. Burkhardt's uh, pilot program, pilot yeah, which was a year prior to that. And I remember it, it striking me. I still remember there was a young lady in that class that worked for Subway. And she was, she said, I had to learn to make a sandwich and I had to take a virtual class for 40 hours online. She's like, I never take, took a virtual class. I actually learned that. And those are those skills that, that, that technology is used for. You know, we do our best to really um, not replace book because I think also at this point, the only publishers, they don't even want to sell us paper. Like, it's, like some of the books and the stuff we're getting is physical because you have those virtual labs, you have those multimedia tools, and you have all that kind of stuff. But one thing that I don't want us doing, this is something that that S level, it drives me nuts when we take a worksheet, a piece of paper, or something that we can do physically and we just convert it to digital. That's completely a waste of time. That's not what technology is for. So we really hammer that, that it's really to create a more depth of learning experience to engage students more and get them to learn the concepts. Uh, but without those tools, we can't always do that. The other thing that we use them extensively for is differentiation. Our students are coming in um, at a kindergarten level that know three letters or maybe know no letters, and we have students that are coming in walking in front of a reader. And trying to balance those two kids, or even our dream box, where we have these math disparities that the kids are at, you know, I have a third grader that's working on an eighth grade level. We have a third grader that's working on a you know, kindergarten level. You know, as a teacher, how do we you know, sell those, give the kids? How do we give them those opportunities? That's what we love with that technology. And we, we try to keep those costs out. I mean, our Chromebook slash are for 180 a piece for a four-year device, five-year device. Or, you know, so we, we try to keep that cost out so that over those years, it, it, it's basically another textbook, both the way we look at it. So, but that study's interesting because it, I, I remember looking at that thing the same thing, like, like you know, how do you, how do you value that impact? That return? So that's I, I my we had a conversation today, about, I mean, we're, we're talking about digital literacy and having those conversations as well, and I've read the studies, handwriting's better, we engage better with text, um, print, but I also know that we're not teaching students how to engage with digital text, and their world is surrounded with digital text, and I'm a person, I do technology for a living, I want a paper book in my hand because that's what I've learned and that's what I've grown up with. So we're looking at a phase where our students don't have skills to interact with, di digitally interact with text because their interactions digitally are with video games, with YouTubes where they are hitting and hitting and they're constantly changing their attention. So we need to help them teach the stamina because like it or not, the state is pushing electronic PSSAs at us where they are having to digitally interact with text. Their world when they go off to college or have an online course or in their job or at Subway having to interact with with digital components. So that is where our focus is in um, 
changing in how we're teaching. We always say technology for Dan and I is a Trojan horse. We're instructional practice folks and looking at instructional practice and moving folks forward and how technology can get us there. So I think it's such a hard question to quantify our kids getting smarter from tech. From, from tech. We hope we're giving them more enriching learning experiences and helping teachers use the technology to do that. And hopefully I mean, that's I mean, making I mean, them smarter. Our training, uh, Mr. Moe was there yesterday, but the second half of our training with our cohort wasn't about, it wasn't about doing um, assessments on the computer, it was about doing authentic assessments. So instead of taking a multiple choice test, I want you to build a project. I want you to build a presentation about how you would deliver a weather report. Explain to me how that front moves in, and I want you to present that to your students are talking about almost like a shark tank experience. And, that's and technology might help you with that, that, but it doesn't have to. Right. I mean, I could give you a multiple choice task, but at the end of the day, I could do that paper. I don't want to do that on technology. That doesn't build us anything. So we're trying to get those experiences. So that's kind of where, that's our focus. And we're, like Mrs. said, we're in from we're like, you know, trainers, we're not tech trainers. Like we, we look at the whole focus. So our training law is about better practice and really engaging students more and trying to get those higher order thinking skills and engaging those skills that are going to be used. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Jerry. Here. Thanks, Jerry. Next. Oh, I have one last I have uh, one last question. Were we able to get any follow up on the Owatin Creek in terms of that cell phone? Yeah, so to fill everyone in, um, since the building of, of Owatin Creek, Owatin has been sort of in a um, cellular efficient um, zone. Um, their building being LEED certified. Um, Leads, uh, lead certified means that we need environmental, we have low E glass, we have you know, all sorts of different materials um, which create uh, an environment that's very difficult for cellular penetration to the building. Um, we met, so we, we, was that last Tuesday that we had our facility? So, uh, Monday. Uh, and so after that, we had, I did have a meeting with an engineer, they came on site, did a site survey. Um, they spent a lot of time looking for um, sort of sweet signal so that they could get an antenna and point in the direction of that signal. Um, they are taking their analysis back and they're doing a reevaluation. And again, part of the initial quote was, how do we get cellular in the building? So here's a quote, this is the off the shelf product, this is what you would do, this is what we would use using Wilson Wireless. Um, the site survey, um, had basically revealed that we need to, to do what was, was really being asked, that we want, we want every classroom to be able to have the, the safety of, of, of cellular coverage in case there's a crisis or emergency. We're looking at around 20 antennas. So um, that moves us, moves the, the bar up a little bit, but um, Wilson and Kit, Kit is the vendor who was out doing the site survey, are in the process of getting a proposal together um, that should address um, the needs. So um, I think that was a good result. They actually found in a, on the instructional side of the building, which is going to be the most challenging side of the building to actually put an antenna on, they found that there was a, there was a part of the building where they could get very clean, direct um, radio. Rate. So um, apparently there's a there's good connection to the golf course over there. So. Uh, so we, we're I'm in the process of you know, getting that proposal, and then once we get it, I will, you know, I will share the results out. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank 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 We actually did it with bid specifications, uh, but we also requested some financing proposal. Uh, and we did it that way because we no vote was taken as to whether we pay cash or whether we would be financed. If we were to finance these as a capital lease or just a pure rental, then the bidding doesn't really apply. But you still uh, really want to look to get the best price. So anyway, number one. I just indicate that no bidder met all the specifications. And I won't go into the weeds on that because it's really uh, maybe not relevant at this point because it's looking like we were doing financing. Um, number two, lowest cost. Brightfield Works 
And again, just to remind you, we included as an alternate propane for the two 77 passengers. So lowest cost across the board was right bill uh, for the four buses, uh, and including the alternate if the board decides they want to select propane for the 77 passenger. As far as the financing goes, uh, we looked at dollar buyout, which is a capital lease purchase, which is what we do with our technology, or fair market value, where uh, you have the choice of you know, making lease payments over a term, and then there's residual, uh, the option of returning the equipment the buses if you don't want them, uh, or pay the residual. <clears throat> but we also can shop around. Uh, these are proposals from the two vendors that did provide costs for the buses. And really the point here is that there were 364,000 uh, approximately for four buses leasing it, an annual payment, so it does provide cash flow review, and that's something that um, we're seeing that uh, we'll need uh, in our budget. Um, and again, like I said, we can um, shop around with other uh, leasing, other banks, uh, which, which we probably will do, just for comparative reasons. And that's how I budgeted it as well, in the preliminary. I included with technology, you include the asset cost, but you also include the matching revenue of a source of financing revenue. Really what's impacting your fund balance is your interest in principal payments. Uh, the other piece to this, number four, is cost to wet hose. If the board wants to go with propane, we would have to have a, a company come in and fuel, uh, whether it be one or two propane buses, uh, once or twice a week. So uh, we did receive costs from E.G. Smith. Uh, if you remember, Jennifer Goldbach did some presentations uh, with the tra at transportation committee meetings about propane. And the estimated cost there, uh, I list, it's $1.29, excuse me, $1.20 per gallon, uh, $5,600 compared to diesel. From that about 6,000. What I would have to do if the board is serious about propane, you know, two of them, the one I have to reduce our bid quantities that we have in the BCI year. I may still have time to do that. But in the fall, we provide water quantities are for diesel, gasoline, uh, oil, and we're committing to that. Uh, but I still may have time to modify that. So finally, number five, not finally, number five considerations. Do we want to uh, include in the recommendation in February, that will be on the board agenda for February, to select propane buses for 77 passenger in lieu of the diesel? Do we want to do two? Do we want to do one to try and see how this really works? Uh, I do want to emphasize propane buses really aren't conducive for long trips. So I, I believe, based upon uh, Rick, Visions is that our entire fleet could not be all propane. We will remain some diesel. Um, and the other consideration, and I think what we may be leaning towards is a capital lease purchase, where at the end of four years or five years, we own the, uh, the bus. Um, you know, the districts that get into a three year rental and turn them over, I think they've gotten into that because their fleet was so aged that they needed to, we feel like they needed to really uh, go with that model. But our, uh, we've tried to keep up with uh, keeping our average age right now about eight years, so I don't know that we want to, at this point, fall into that model. Uh, and I just wanted to mention about the uh, state grant, AFID. We would apply in the spring. That's where you can apply for um, funding for the difference between diesel and Propane. So, based upon these numbers and listing them over two, we could apply for maybe $5,000. Because the difference in the cost for diesel is $175,000 and propane $108,000 based upon the right row body works. Finally, uh, Roush, who uh, is one of the leaders in propane, um, has 
invited different school districts, including Exeter and Ben Bernhard, uh, their series about propane to attend a tour on February 21st. He would miss half the day on the 20th and then the tours on the 21st, where tour of the plant uh, as well as to uh, speak with other districts that are using propane and build his knowledge base about school transportation. It's fully funded, taken care of by Roush. Um, so um, I guess I want to get a feel for February. Do you, are we serious about propane? And are, do we agree that we should do a capital lease purchase? Which I would recommend. I'll just say one thing about propane. Something that I learned in the process is we investigated propane buses last year with our transportation committee was that there's some also some benefits and some savings not only you know from the, you know we're not only looking at the fact these are environmentally you know you know better uh, you know, uh, products um, the cleaner they they provide less particulate and um, are I think easier to start up and manage but they're also cheaper in terms of maintenance and significantly cheaper in terms of maintenance. And I know that's not necessarily factored in here. I don't think it makes up the difference, let's say, between, you know, uh, 175000 and $180,000. Um, you know, it is something that's considered over the top over the course of time. Also, with the lease question, I mean, do we, are we responsible for maintenance with the, with the lease uh, relationship? Is that, do we, do we still maintain the same responsibility for caring, maintaining the bus? For a couple of lease purchases. Uh, yeah, I, I, I like, I mean, we've been talking about propane for a while as a transportation committee. Uh, we wanted to kind of see if we could get into it. I think, you know, there are you know, I think some small cash differentials which are hard to, to really evaluate in terms of the overall impact. Um, but I, I have a very, very favorable impression of propane and, and it's something that um, I know we've talked about before. And, and I, would, I would personally suggest we move forward with it. That's my goal. And, and, and maybe you said this, maybe I just didn't catch it properly. Do we have financing options available for propane? Yeah, the example I gave here, I just list diesel. The financing is available for propane. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'd also like to say, too, just to kind of follow up, I, I also like the financing. I think it does provide us, particularly now, with you know, better uh, cash flow. Mm -hmm. uh, so, my question is. I saw that there's so buses there from 77 to 54, so it's like 23 more uh, kids. What's our average size of bus right now? Is it a 54 passenger or a 77? Like our, the average bus for the average? Are you asking if we have more 77? Like yeah. more 77 passengers. Well, we do have more 77. Do they have a propane in the 54 or all? The smaller type of buses or no? Well, the 54 passenger might, would be a, a bus that may do a lot of the non-public routes and they're traveling quite a distance. Uh, you know, out of uh, you know, this county. So we felt that uh, selecting routes uh, that were, uh, didn't travel a lot of distance were more uh, in the neighborhood. <coughs> Yeah, that, uh, that's why we decided to uh, Thank you. I like the idea of the propane that was in the room with the too. Can we actually talk, talk to that? Is there a little bit of information necessary to have a bus on? Do you have propane buses or special training? Or Some people had spoke previously at the meetings and the podcast and the additional things that we have. Well, um, mm -hmm. any training that would be necessary might be just making them familiar uh, with the bus. I'm sure uh, right now uh, would be very accommodating as far as letting the mechanics know different things, drivers know different if it operates any different. Now, as far as fueling, I think that was the biggest question. Uh, lead hosing, EG, the company actually would do all that. And we do 
have a low area down there where you probably should do the wet comes in once or twice. And you still have to be once or twice a week. So I'm not sure if I move it. Yeah. Fuel? Fuel. Fuel. They would do the fueling until we get to the point where we can have our tank. Just so I understand your breakdown here, the number for where it says compared to diesel costs, is that saying that it's almost 3000 above what we would be paying annually to fuel one of the diesel buses? Or is that saying that the annual cost of fueling would be almost $3,000? Uh, diesel for the fuel for the amount of uh, gallons for 277 passengers would cost us about for one bus, $2,955, $3,000, whereas based on assuming four gallons per mile for propane, diesel, I assume six gallons per mile, that cost is $1.20, is you know, 2790 Diesel right now, I don't have prices for next year yet, this year it's $1.90. So that's just cheaper to go Ann or anybody, do you have any information from, from the school districts that are on this route? I like the idea of kind of experiment with one or two buses. But have gone this route and found and been surprised or blindsided by costs that they didn't anticipate. There's a district out there in Illinois somewhere that tries to say, oh my God, we didn't figure on the the ump the ump factor. Uh, our our uh, transportation committee went to Upper Moral School District in Upper Moral. Yeah, and we had a tour of their facility. We got a chance to talk to their, you know, some of their drivers, their transportation coordinator. They were thrilled, you know, with their with their conversion of propane. They converted their entire fleet, and I, I seem to recall it was several million dollars for that conversion. So that was a you know full complete conversion, and and, and they had their own dedicated you know, full fueling station there. Um, it was very, they seemed very efficient, they seemed very happy with it, and they were pleased that we came to visit. And I think it was generally the impression of the, uh, uh, the committee that, you know, it was, it was just a good option, you know, if we could, but there were obviously costs associated with implementation, purchasing the buses, the infrastructure necessary, uh, and those were some of the limitations that we saw at that time. As I say, I like the idea of, of doing our own experiment and uh, accumulating our own information. Would it be possible to go back to that group and ask them the question I asked? What, what were the surprises? What did you figure on that you're now dealing with? What were the problems that you're solving now that you didn't anticipate? John, I'm sure we can ask them that question. I, I, it was my impression that they, did, they didn't encounter anything that represent a surprise, but and you were there too. But do you recall any downside from their perspective? Uh, no, I I don't recall any downside. Um, and we can surely ask around to uh, other districts because some of those that are invited, it's like Penn Ridge, Pensbury, um, Haverford. So I'll reach out and see if there are things that we need to think about. Right. I mean, I know we can't eliminate risk, but we can try to reduce it to as close to zero. Right? And I can find good. that out and communicate between now and the February meeting. Okay, great. Thank you. And the grants um, that we can apply for for the difference in price, is that something we can do yearly? If it's uh, available and has been for the past few years, so it comes out twice a year, it didn't make sense for us to apply in December by the December deadline because we had no decision. So if the board was ahead with it in February, then when they open it up in April, which they believe they will, we'll apply for it. It's a reimbursement. So I think you're, you're looking to see, or, or at least get some indication that the board might be receptive to the idea of the leasing and the program. Right. Um, In addition to the other two. Yeah. 
I'm not, I'm not hearing or seeing any dissent. Um, so I'll just to try to help you out. Okay. In terms of All right. <coughs> Thanks. Any more questions for Mr. Scott? Okay. Opportunity for public comment. This is a chance for folks in the audience who would like to address the board. Anything on the agenda as well as uh, any other subjects that might be uh, relevant for the board uh, to be heard this time. Also, can I give Ben Bernhardt go ahead and just commit to going to learn more about protein? I, yes. Yeah. Mr. Gillick. Good evening, everybody. Jared Gellick, 106 Michelle Drive, for now. Uh, the other day, I want to make you aware, the other day, I was walking into Target, and there was a group of kids walking out. They were 13, 14 years old. I'm assuming they were junior high school kids, uh, Exeter junior high kids, though I don't know that. One of them was carrying a Starbucks cup, and I saw him do this, boom, and just throw it on the ground. And I said, dude, what are you doing? You're literally, pick that up. There's a garbage can right over there. He turned to me and said, F you, old man. I got to tell you, I'm really threatened by this. Okay? These terroristic threats that were thrown at by an Exeter student, I think, I'm not sure, could be an Exeter student. So I'm here tonight to ask the school board to stick by their policies against terroristic threats. Though it happened out in public, not in the schools, and not even necessarily was it an Exeter student. I don't even know. But something needs to be done. Mike, can I ask you to get my back? And what I'd like to know is, did you report it to the police because it occurred in public? It's immaterial. No, it's not immaterial. It's immaterial. You should have called law enforcement and had law enforcement show up. You believe it was a terroristic threat, which is part of the Pennsylvania criminal code. So you would call the police and they would investigate that and then make a determination. It's immaterial. And are you going to shed tears over, over my flight out in public? Allison, we asked Dr. Hendler, what happens if we don't follow our policy? Or will we do nothing? Because I don't have the room ringed by people wearing blue shirts and a transparent, silly attempt at a PR stunt meant to garner favor with the public in a contract. Will you sit here knowing that a First Amendment issue is exactly that? If so, why were we so loud last night? Your solicitor is your legal advisor. Your solicitor told you this is a First Amendment issue. The police in Exeter are the legal advisor in this township, and they can concur that it's a First Amendment issue. Christine Wheeling, your HR director, set forth all the steps that were taken, all of which were in recommendation by your solicitor. It sounds to me like you think that the solicitor is giving you bad advice. So if you feel the need to act outside of uh, all of this that was said and what you were committed to do. So if your solicitor is giving you bad advice, it's your responsibility to fire them. You have that ability to do that tonight by making a motion having a discussion, taking a vote, and firing In fact, you have the responsibility to do so, to do that for the taxpayers of this township, the people who are at the top of your hierarchy. If you don't do that, you're clearly either not taking this seriously, or you're in dereliction of your duty to the taxpayer. It's either that or you're not convinced that this is what was portrayed last week. Further, I'll state that if Mr. McGinney is indeed traumatized, by anonymous threats that were clearly written in a farcical manner by a very young or very foreign person, meaning that they are far away. To the point of losing sleep, and it affected his family life, as he stated. Perhaps you should be looking into his mental faculties and questioning him being around our kids. Either that, or it is, as I said, a dumb PR stuff. The administration acted as the solicitor suggested they do. Now, you can back your administration for the first time ever, by the way, or you can back the teachers' union who endorsed you in your election. But I caution you that this tax cut and many others are watching. 
Thank you, Joe. Is there anyone, anyone else in the audience who would like to comment? Can I just say quick? Um, oh, sure. You know, Jerry, I think it's, I think it is sad that a student would have said that to you. And I definitely don't think that that represents what we want our students to be able to achieve coming out of Exeter. Um, and, you know, I apologize for what it's worth. You didn't do happened. it. No, oh, I understand. But, you know, that's certainly not the kind of education that we want to be encouraging. Um, and in whatever way we can do something to the opposite of that effect, I think we should not only littering, but being disrespectful to members of the community. So I appreciate you bringing that to our attention. Okay, I'd just like to ask you, that actually happened, or was that part no, of No, I made that up. Um, as part of an illustration. I, that's what, okay. See, you saw through. You were smiling at me. I know. I, you know, I, I, I kind of thought maybe. Yeah. Can I might say, my tears last week when I said I was emotional prior to being there is because my mother passed away. The tears weren't fake. They weren't a grandstand as you had just done. Mm -hmm. I was emotional because it's unfortunate that a teacher would go through what he went through and that kids in our district would do something like that. But I wasn't communicating, and it wasn't set up. Just you. Okay, thanks. We'll move on in the agenda. Um, and I want to remind our board members that um, this evening we'll be following the consent agenda process. Uh, this is a situation where uh, typically new, newer board members, um, if you see an item on the agenda that you'd like to pull out for specific purposes, <coughs> If you're uncomfortable with it, if you'd like to have further discussion on it, you can do that. Um, otherwise, we'll be taking um, groups of, of motions and, and putting them into a single motion. And we're starting out with the minutes. Um, so it's recommended the board approve the, uh, the three sets of minutes in the agenda. Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. Treasurer's report. Uh, recommended the uh, board school directors approve the paper report and payment requests. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Um, any opposed? Motion carries. Board policies. Um, I would like to pull one of these policies off of the agenda entirely. Um, it's, it's item six. We had this conversation, I think, last week where we thought we might want to keep this one from being deleted, and um, it's, it's still on here, but this kind of falls into the social networking um, area, and so I think it, it's one of those policies we probably want to continue to look at, maybe our policy committee meeting with this one. Okay. So, uh, I'd like to recommend um, the board approve um, policy recommendations for uh, items one th through five and seven through nine. We so have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Oh, okay. um, have there, has there been any consideration of any changes or revisions or, or thinking about policy 24 based on the conversation we had last week? There hasn't been at this point right now. It's up, it's up for first reading <coughs> between now and at second reading. If we're going to do that, we'll do that. And that could be on our agenda as well. Yeah. I uh, because I know we had some real serious questions about some of those. That's true. Um, and I'm not sure how to get, I mean, unless everybody attends that, that committee meeting, I'm not sure how we're going to get folks input on that unless you to provide us with some uh, email with your with your thoughts on it. So before Thursday, and send you something. No, okay. <laughs> I mean, it would just be nice if, if, there, if folks have questions about any specific item there because uh, we're going to be talking about it on, on Thursday. Thanks for bringing that one up. Yeah, this is probably just procedural, but I see that a policy at 16 we're deleting video monitors. I just heard Joe say that we have about 300 of them. Is that go, did that go somewhere else? Administrative breaks. Administrative breaks. Okay. Dr. Deesburg. <clears throat> Thanks. Any further discussion? All those deletes are going to be 
All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Motion removed. Yes, sir. Did we have to vote to remove it from the agenda? Uh, I assume I thought that was part of the motion. Okay. It was part of the motion. Okay, so it's all fine. Okay. So we can move on to business functions, Mr. Harris. Uh, it is recommended that the board of school directors approve the following business functions items. One, two, three, four, five. Five it is recommended that the board of school directors approve the submission. The Berks County Tax Claim Bureau of the Exeter Township School District interim taxes declared delinquent for 610 for 10 accounts in the amount of $9,225.34. Uh, that was not on the voting, uh, that was not on the workshop agenda. I do have a report for the committee afterwards, but motion. Is that your second? second, sir? No, I, I made it. Second. Any discussion? Just a question, Ian. Are we allowed to report publicly what the reduction from Walmart would be as part of this action? Yes, because I'll have to reflect it in, in the budget. So what is the, with the assessment appeal filed by Walmart, what is that impact on the school district's budget? Okay, um, the, in terms of school real estate taxes for this year, because it's effective July 1, 2019, it's $48,669. And for 7 1 2020, uh, it's $75,938 based upon the current millage rate. Is that? Yes. Thank you. Can I follow up on that quick? Do, do we know if there's any legislation at the state level that's seeking to control the reassessment requests? Because um, as I understand it, and I think Mike, you've spoken to this before that this is becoming a routine business practice. And I don't begrudge business for using the law as it is written, um, but it's certainly, you know, it, it's, it's very difficult for us to work through that. Um, and it's also not something that's very common, as I understand it, with regular households. And, you know, I just wonder if there's any legislation that's been moving statewide that we know of. It's only the limitations on our ability to reassess and ask for I can look into it. I'm not aware of any, but we'll control it. But um, <coughs> school districts do not pick and choose what they uh, want to uh, do a reverse appeal. They can be consistent in how you uh, view the property, so sort of commercial or residential. Yeah. Well, we have, we have a standard. Right. Right. But, but the, that, that's not and nothing on the other side as of yet. I, I, I think, um, I don't know how, how deep we want to go with this. Um, I think Sharon, I, I believe you're the legislative liaison. If, if the board was willing to, I think, did I have that right? John? Oh, sorry, John. Sorry, John. Are you the alternate chair? Okay. Um, if, if there's some type of resolution that we could um, look at at some point, and it doesn't even have to be this this year because I know that we've got plenty of other things going on but you know I think I think that might be worthwhile and maybe even bringing up to the PSBA conference when we come back to that in October because um, this is certainly seems like an issue I know that there's some issues that we have in Brecknock um, not that we get involved with but that happen um, in the Governor Midland area uh, so I, I wonder if this is something where we could maybe put an opinion out there and possibly raise it with the PSBA to be on the legislative agenda. Yeah, I've heard that come up. I mean, when we hear from uh, <coughs> PSBA, you know, in terms of any legislative updates, it, this has not been on their radar. It's not even one of the issues that the, the, the PCIU is really kind of promoting when they go to Harrisburg and advocate um, for, the, for the state legislature. So, you know, but, uh, you know, I, I think we could formulate an idea of what it should look like or what, what we'd like to see changed. I mean, that's a start. So, you have some thoughts in mind, and I guess a good summary of what your thoughts are would be a bad idea. I'm not going to do it right now. 
No. <laughs> Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Personnel committee, Mr. Colson. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I just had a quick report because it's not at the end of the agenda. So um, we had our first business functions committee meeting uh, this evening, which I thought um, was successful in what we were trying to accomplish. I think we set out some ambitious goals, and, and we know that there are some concerns among administrators about that and how to achieve those exactly. Um, so we're going to be really digging into that, and I, I'm really encouraging um, other members of the board, um, and I appreciate that we did have a number of you guys there this evening, so thank you for that. Um, I'm just encouraging all members of the board to be engaged with this process. We really are trying to dig into the details here and to understand this intricately so that we really can have an informed discussion about any type of control measures, any type of reductions that we want to go with um, as we get closer to June. Because we certainly don't want to have the situation where we had last year where the board became very, very engaged at the end, um, and it was difficult to make really big decisions, I think. Um, so we definitely want to be parsing that out. And I just ask that you guys stay engaged. Um, and I'll certainly continue to send you all the attachments. And we'll probably be getting some this week about our progress. And, and this will be followed. And the video, the, vid, the video for the meeting um, will also be posted publicly. So you're more than welcome to engage through that. But I also just want to say thank you um, to staff, um, Bob, Patrick, and Ann, putting up with my questions almost on the daily. So I just really appreciate you guys being patient with me. Um, and I understand that could probably be hard sometimes. So thank you. We'll try to keep up. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll have that out. I don't know why it got admitted. We'll add it to the back of the end of it. Oh, OK. I, I don't know if it was ever there before. I just don't know if there was ever a discussion portion again. Well, it'll be there for now. Because you know I like it. <laughs> you? <laughs> it's a kind of shell. This is false. It is recommended that the Board of School Directors approves or ratifies the filing personnel items one through seven. Any discussion? I just wanted to say that um, Mrs. Rance is retiring after 12 years at Exeter, and she has worked in multiple disabilities, emotional support, and itinerant support at the high school. And I talk, um, she emailed me that she hopes in retirement to take extended visits to the beach and visits with her son and daughter out of the state. But she does have future plans to stay involved in the field of education. Thank you. Real quick, Dave, I just want to just do a quick call out for a recent graduate, Carly Schmidt, who's coming back to the Data Substitute in elementary education. And I just think, again, as I've said several times, it's really um, I think a blessing that we have a lot of alumni coming back um, to get back to the so. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No uh, Student functions. Uh, there is a, a report on field trips. And recommended that the Board of School Directors approve uh, items. And I can read that item. Item 10, Section A and B. Second. Any discussion? The, oh, you're right. So, so he's just on item B, student function consent? No. He did 10 to A and B. So 10 is student functions, and then A and B is field trips and students. Yeah, well, that's just a report for A, but yeah. B would be the other one. So it can be 10, A and B. Any discussion? Oh, I'm sorry, was there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Do we know the mileage? Um, no, you go around. I just have a question. I just want to know what the mileage was. 40 meters. 40 The The contract. Right, that's the kind of thing. So he says, what is the mileage? Um, plus mileage. I mean, I know what it is. I just know how much like, we're paying for their travel uh, to and from. Yeah, is that, and my question is that typical that you pay mileage for a tutor? Yes, for the tutors, yes. Uh, Common tutors? Yes. Common contract line tutors. Is it, so it's tutoring, it's, it's uh, mileage from their home? 
from their homes in here. Okay. I do believe the person is a Berks County person, so they're not coming from too far. Do we pay the state for the federal government? Yeah. It went down this year, so they're saving us money, one half a penny at a time. Is this a special education student? Yes. It is. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. <coughs> Athletic Committee, Mr. Trapina. I have nothing on the agenda. I do have a meeting scheduled with Mr. Gann to try to put together a schedule of that money. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, curriculum committee, Dr. McClendon. Okay, so we met this Tuesday before the, uh, the workshop meeting, and uh, we had a presentation by Ann Wall. She gave us an update on the um, district math goals. Um, I was really impressed with uh, the work that she's done along with her team as far as, uh, you know, researching information, collecting a lot of data. She observed in every building at every grade level, not every classroom, but at least uh, every grade level. And met with principals, teachers, math chairs. And she also reached out to other people, Rose Belinsky, uh, someone from the DCIU and two people from PDE. Um, she put together a handout with uh, identifying all the strengths and also areas of growth. Um, there were a few months ago, I guess, in some of the meetings, like this is a big concern about the uh, textbooks that we use and you know, math scores are a concern. So that's what she's really uh, looking at, ways to try to improve that and, and uh, you know, see what we can do to do that. They looked at um, one school. I, did you just talk to people at Springford about their math? Yeah, well, I, I had a conversation with, with Eric Flam, who you know, knows some folks at Springford, and we were talking about their math scores in general because they're very good. Mm -hmm. um, I, I believe close to 90 percent. So I had asked what kinds of things they were doing, and we're doing a lot of job and professional development. They they pay a consultant who comes in and is basically doing a lot of math coaching with teachers on a regular basis. Right. So I know there are questions about the investigations and you know uh, the right material, but it's finding out that it is things uh, you know like teacher training and other supplemental resources and support that there's no perfect program. Um, but she, uh, you have the minutes uh, that Marianne sent, and it's all detailed, like on front and back page, with all the things that were discussed in the meeting. So you know, I recommend you to take a look at that. We um, meet again next. Uh, I mean, Feb not next, February 11th, before the uh, workshop meeting. Uh, at that meeting. Um, Ms. Wallach is going to be able to talk a little bit more. There were a lot of, during the meeting, there were a lot of, of questions and feedback. I don't know. So she's going to have a little bit of time at the beginning of the meeting, but we're also going to be reviewing the Soaring Eagle for the junior high and senior high, and then that will be on the voting uh, for, for February. Thank you, Dr. Hunter. Facilities, uh, Mr. Pedro. Thanks, uh, Dr. Hemberger. Uh, we had our first meeting, um, and the minutes actually were posted today, um, so I'm going to go through them in detail. Basically, we're looking at three uh, potential projects right now, the cell phone project at Owatton, and we're looking forward to the information from, from Mr. Way and his group. Um, we're also looking at the uh, bus garage. I have not been down there to uh, take my first look, uh, so I'll be calling um, Mr. Wayman to do that, and uh, Mr. Miller and perhaps uh, Dr. Hearing will be coming along with me. And we're also, we took a first look at the uh, proposed uh, improvements and changes to this building. We'll be hitting all three of those very hard in the months to come, but that's where we are now. Uh, I encourage everyone to look at the minutes, which were posted today, and uh, 
couple or two uh, state in the next few weeks. Uh, this is this committee does not have a regular home, so to speak, on the, on the calendar. So uh, we'll probably get together again within the next uh, month or so to uh, update the group uh, on this project. Here, you have anything yeah. to add? Um, the only thing I'll say is that we definitely have to go and maybe we'll maybe should schedule a day to go not only to that facility but also to that Miss Carroll proposed site as well. So we can kind of take a look at that, see what they uh, can do for us on that side. Good point. Uh, I remember the community has given us a report on that, but uh, you're right. We should probably do that as part of community too. Thanks. And that's all I have. Thanks, Mr. Fiddler. Uh, personnel committee, Mr. Fulton. I don't have anything at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, policy committee, um, as I had mentioned previously, the committee of the meeting is Thursday at 3.30 here in the hospital. Um, we're going to be covering policies um, that have to do with terrorist threats, um, all over harassment. We'll be taking a, another look at the memorial policy and um, the technology policy that was set for deletion today, as well as the relationship with students policy that I would reference in our series of drawings today. So that's on the list of things to do for Thursday. Student Functions uh, Committee, Mrs. Stratton, I'm assuming she's going to have no report tonight. Technology Committee, Mr. Miller. Um, I guess Mr. White kind of stole my thunder in the technology part of things, so, uh, there's really nothing to report. Um, I do. Pro I will probably follow up with them on the, some of the things that deal a lot in technology in terms of the cell phone uh, issue, uh, but other than that, uh, really nothing to report. Thanks, Mr. Mills. Uh, Education Foundation, um, Dr. Herman. They did not have a meeting this month. The next meeting they're having is February 6th, which I believe is February 6th. Thank you. BCTC Joint Operating Committee, Dr. McClennan. So I do not have a report because we have not met since the last report. We actually meet tomorrow. Thank you. BCIU report. Uh, I attended the BCIU meeting on uh, January the 16th. Um, it was board appreciation evening. We all got a nice little fuzzy animal. And he had a hedgehog. He see, uh, is that what it was? It was a hedgehog. <laughs> I gave it to my grandkids. They love it. Um, and, and a little uh, BCIU cup, which reminded me that this is board appreciation month and we should all be I think uh, uh, for yourself. Yes. <laughs> uh, we're looking for that. You know, <laughs> so yeah, this nice. morning breakfast coming up. So, um, you know, it was a uh, it was an evening as well that um, where we had uh, students who were um, showcased in terms of their artwork from every school district, including Exeter. So, I'll speak. On that. Are you going to speak on that? So I'll, I'll let uh, Dr. Cole speak on that. But Lauren Cozy was there with the parents, and it was uh, that was a nice event. Also, in regard to the meeting itself, uh, there was the retirement of Tim. Uh, Hefner, he's from the Fleetwood School District, but he had 19 years in the BCIU, and had, uh, I think the large portion of that, he had been the board president, so he received a lot of accolades in his retirement uh, as the BCIU board president. Um, the, uh, they provided us with the BCIU state of the uh, unit, which is a handout, um, and this is an excellent brochure that really kind of goes into detail in terms of the various major program areas and what they're what they're uh, you know, planning on doing for the year. So um, I could pass this around to folks and they can take a quick look at it. Um, there was a legislative update. Um, I think I forwarded that to you, Mr. Biller, in terms of you know, just kind of getting an up update in terms of what's happening um, you know, at the state level. Uh, and a big focus on charter schools. Uh, and um, the, um, there's a hearing that's being scheduled on HB 18897 that the PCIU is actually going to be um, uh, Dr. Hackman is going to do. It was this morning. Was it this morning? Yeah, she was uh, down there representing the first camp. So that was, and that was a really a, a big. Uh, of course, Sunny's represented Sunny's. No. So, so that that was reported on. Um, 
And uh, then finally, the draft of the uh, proposed budget for next year and Exeter's contribution to the budget uh, will be $49,655, which is a 0% increase from last year, which is a, a good thing. So I'll pass this around. This is just a very brief budget summary, uh, but you can see where uh, Exeter was last year and this year in terms of uh, cost for item services programs. Can we send them a thank you? Pardon? Can we send them a thank you? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, you, you do it. I thank you. Okay. Uh, let's leave these on. Uh, just very briefly, I met with uh, Dr. Hemberger. Um, I'm going to start off by uh, I get lots of emails with uh, different summaries of legislation, so what I'm trying to do is sift through that and send more board members what is appropriate and what you might be interested in. However, if you hear something that you'd like to uh, receive more information on, please let me know. I can coordinate that. The other thing I, I'm going to do is uh, set up meetings with the legislators who represent Exeter Township, and uh, I will let you all know when I'm going to do that. And if we're going to come along and uh, have a good uh, first, uh, first exercise. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what I'm doing so far. Thanks, Mr. Township Borough Lease, I'm Mr. Topini. Uh, I was pleased tonight to see two township supervisors at our business function meeting, uh, former school board member Joe Staub and a new township supervisor, Greg Galtier, so it's nice to see them there. Uh, it's nice that we're going to look to get together with the, the township board of supervisors just in an informal setting. Hope it can be, sir. Yeah, hopefully that doesn't you know, violate the sunshine <laughs> rules or whatever, but we can open it to the public. Uh, but I, I think that uh, there's a lot of work that we uh, are looking and hoping to do together and we realize the uh, critical nature of the relationship with the township and with St. Lawrence um, and the role that um, the community plays in uh, looking at issues around economic development and other items uh, that could certainly assist the community at large and the residents, but also the school district is a byproduct of that. So, we have a lot of issues to uh, address, and we'll be getting together um, informally, formally, as as need be, and we'll report that to the review. Thank you, Mr. Chapin. Superintendent's report, Dr. Phillips. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Hamburger. As was mentioned, uh, Thursday, January 16th, uh, I was there, Dr. Hamburger was there, Christina Pinkerton, the, uh, our teacher, were there to help honor Lauren Posey and her family. Uh, the topic of the art show this year was faces and facilities. Lauren did a, I it was art cup, it was oil, and there was pastel. And and it was a whole bunch of things that I had no idea. I had trouble crossing the car between the lines. Um, and she chose to do a rendition of the Exeter uh, State Football Stadium during a game. Um, you can clearly see the football players on the sideline on the field. Um, you can clearly make out the stands, the field house. Uh, in our discussion of, of just asking her how she was doing, uh, Christina Pinkerton brought up an idea about making a print of it. So they're looking into that, and uh, she will be looking to, uh, I guess, investigate selling those prints to anybody that possibly played on that field, an alumnus of the school district. Uh, and then at the end of the year, when the print come, or when the painting would go back to her, um, interested in, in auctioning it off to a person who would be interested in getting it, um, she's going off to college at either Carnegie Mellon or Pitt, and her parents would be happy to hear that she's raising some money to help pay for her books. Uh, don't know how much I'm going to spill the beans on you, uh, Dr. McClendon, but there was a professional advisory committee meeting this morning. Uh, with Dr. Kraft at the West Campus. Uh, a couple of things that went on, or that were discussed, um, would be a needs assessment that will be going out to the districts to expand on the BCTC role in the county and meeting the needs of the sending districts. Some of the questions will be the role of the BCTC, who aren't we serving, uh, certain time frames that it will occur, and some of the questions will be done at a superintendent roundtable. 
A survey will be uh, developed through SurveyMonkey and that will go out to students as well. There was discussion of different uh, programs that they're providing, programs that they're looking to improve upon. There was discussion about a internship program that they're looking at getting. It's actually a adult continuing ed registered apprenticeship provider application um, to provide that throughout the county. Applications will be coming out shortly for their STEAM camp, which is held at the East Campus on June 15th through the 19th. Uh, we've had several of our students attend, and a good portion of the students that attend uh, go on to apply and are accepted in the programs at the BCTC programs. Um, the calendars are from BCTC. Uh, will be shortly going out and the calendar is set on a majority of the district's uh, calendars with as far as uh, setting up when their days when their first day of school starts uh, dr. Kraft has set that to the different superintendents and as the superintendents bring their calendars as we will be doing next month for approval those calendars will then be uh, recognized by CT the BCTC and then the finalized counter, uh, calendar for that will take place. A uh, new program that's being discussed is a diversified occupations program. It's a one-year senior year program. It will not result in anyone getting any types of certifications. They need to go through a lot more uh, yearly projects and uh, instruction to gain the uh, not only the certification but sit for the NACTI exam. But this one-year program is being uh, advertised as a program for a senior that still has yet to decide what he wants to do. The senior program will be based on the construction trade. It will give the students, again, not a certified amount of instruction, but instruction in all areas of construction, such as carpentry, uh, and, uh, electrical, plumbing, and so forth and will set them up for a job as if to a, go into a laborer role uh, in construction. Um, I also, and I'll be passing this on to uh, Andy Wallach, but as we were discussing, uh, I know there's always a discussion about financial literacy, and it was uh, discussed at the uh, CTC that BB and T um, if you invite them out for a career fair, and we have a STEM fair that we'll be inviting them to, they will provide us free an online program for financial literacy called EverFine. So we we're pursuing that for our students that will be able to do that as well. Kind of a virtual look into the financial literacy program. And there are, it's nine lessons, so that will take place. Uh, finally, I just want to comment a little bit about the in-service plate that took place yesterday. There were no students, but the majority of our staff, save about 25 people, uh, showed up for a conference style session yesterday that arranged anything from instructional pro uh, process and projects that our teachers are doing to LGBTQ, to the Attorney General's office to talk about uh, different types of language used in the classroom, uh, appropriateness. Uh, all of it centered around diversity and equity. Um, as I've heard to this point, it's been received very well. We started the day off with an activity uh, that we called, uh, it was a starburst activity we called Star Power, and it had to do with the recognition of what students bring into our classrooms and how we respond to them and how they feel. Um, that was also well received. That's a better part. Thanks, Dr. Phillips. I, I have to say, I'm some of us who attended that in uh, the service yesterday, I think very few were there. John did. And, uh, you know, I thought it was extremely well organized. And kudos to Dr. Winters and your staff and all the administrators who were involved in the development of the, uh, the agenda, the program, the format. It's great. The use of our teachers primarily. I know there were some folks from the outside who were, who were there, but I mean, to give the, the teachers a selection, uh, I know in our session I was in with John and we were doing mindfulness and breathing. and. Um, and how to focus and the count we the guidance counselors and they did a really great job. But teachers were very attentive, they were engaged, and it was just an uh, impressive um, uh, you know, uh, activity that we So I want to, again, thank the administration and folks for involved in that. Thank you. Um, 
Are there any um, are there any uh, board members who would like to be heard at this time? Before we adjourn, I just want to indicate that we will have an exception, uh, executive session following this meeting to address uh, legal and personnel matters. Um, at this point, I'll accept a motion for adjournment. Move. Second. Thank you. Uh,